Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, my name is Lainey davis Rucker. I'm president and CEO of Julie Billiard Schools. Um, this is a smaller turnout, so please feel free to get to know each other and do a little bit of a dialogue. Um, we do have a number of people online. Thanks for being here and welcome. Um, part of today is really this continuation of our parent series um, that really came from you guys. We listened to what our hot topics and we try to provide um, some experts in the field, um, some which are at Julie Billiard School, some which are sitting here today. Um, and we did kind of create this consortium to support our parents and our community. Um, Dr. Burke sadly had a family emergency. Um, so he is not gonna be with us tonight. Um, but we are gonna still use his content. We are still going to talk through all of those pieces. If you have questions directly for Dr. Burke, we can get them to him um, and relay the answers. But we do feel as if we've backfilled nicely with a bench here that are still kind of experts in the field. Um, so quick reminder um, for anyone online, please submit your questions into the chat. Um, if there's problems, if you have comments, um, we will be monitoring those. So please feel free to do that. And also know you will receive a copy of this presentation afterwards. So if there's not something that you can see or hear, um, you will get it afterwards. So today's hot topic is the challenges and opportunities of technology for your special needs child. Um, we have a wonderful team here, not Dr. Burke, but we have Josh Mazako, who's our technology coordinator. Um, he really does uh, organize our technology throughout the network of schools, supports our students in understanding um, what are some accommodations and some of the assistive technology and how they can use it, but also some of what are the safeguards. And he really supports our faculty and staff to how to integrate technology into the classroom to better engage our students um, in the curriculum. And then we have Mrs. Jody Johnson, who is our Director of Academics and Teacher Development. Um, she was our principal at our Lindhurst campus for 15 years. Um, she really has seen the changes in technology, the changes in our students and how it's affecting our students. And she really has worked with so many parents and has really kind of become an expert in this, in this space. Um, and then we have Mary Jo O'Neill from Hickman and Louder, um, who's a parent advocate. And she also is um, a user of, a believer in, and an advocate for all of the assistive technology um, that exists for our students. So today we're going to cover um, technology in the classroom, some of the benefits and safeguards that we use at JV, but also that are out there, um, the examples of keeping students safe in the classroom. Um, then we are going to touch on the risks of technology, um, how you can support your student at home, the amount of parents that we hear say, our kid broke through the firewall, or our kid is on sites that we don't know, um, or our kid has friends that aren't safe friends. Um, we're gonna talk through all of that today and hopefully give you some resources and, and just a community that can support you as you navigate this kind of wonderful and tough topic. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mr. McGuckto. Hi, <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Josh Mazzacco. Um, I was originally a business, had a business degree, and then I switched over to education. I did start in information technology um, during my first years of college, um, but I've, and now I've been with JB for 12 years. I've taught seventh grade for many of those years. I have a couple of our students here tonight, Matthew and Nicole. Hi. Um, I've been a technology coordinator and tech integration coach for the last eight years at Julie Billiard. I've worked at summer camp as an intervention specialist and tech coordinator there for eight years. I'm Google level certified too. And during the pandemic, I was the frontline contact for the parents, the students, the teachers, and I helped with tech and just keeping everybody sane during that really tough time. <laughs> um, I understand what it's like to be in a JV classroom and I give our students and teachers realistic expectations and strategies to help their days and lives be less stressful with all this wonderful stuff that we have nowadays. Um, the first thing we're gonna talk about is some of the cool things we have this year at JV. Um, first one's Go Guardian, and I have a quick little video here of what a teacher would do 
with GoGuardian to keep the kids safe in the classroom. This would be an example of a GoGuardian. Um, all the different things the teacher would start at once and the kids would be on their computer and then the teacher would click on a certain kid and see what the challenges were. Um, they can tell the students the side of the list, see if they're showing them just to be fun. But if the teachers tell us that if they want them to, um, you can open the activities for kids that might have struggles making things end. It's hard to know how to our assistance. I can change our friends that can laugh with us because there's no aspect of behavior. Um, you can chat with the student directly on the mobile and read it uh, there on your screen and you can kind of take it to get click here. Um, so it's really efficient, makes it easy for the teacher to use this in their events. Um, keep it in eye on things and make sure that the teachers are doing what the teacher is asking them to do. And something like this group where an expected person expected behavior and things like that. Okay, so Nicole and Matthew are probably happy that wasn't around when they were in school, but uh, the, the kid was there, actually, they were doing a project on what they wanted for Christmas, so it was okay that they were on the shopping for shoes, okay, um, but if they were on something they weren't supposed to be, the teacher could close it or lock their device, and the whole point is to shape behaviors and build trust with the students. Um, we don't ever want to necessarily be blocking everything, and we want to build trust with the kids so that they are doing the right thing and then because we ask them to and they know it's the right thing to do. Um, along with that, we have uh, something called Securely, which monitors the kids' searches. Um, and then I was also on a call today with the uh, Ohio School Safety Center and a couple of ex-policemen now work um, for the Ohio schools. And they're just explaining to me how they monitor things like TikTok and stuff like during big high school football games in the area. And they don't necessarily like follow certain students or certain things, but they will check on the internet message boards and certain apps just to make sure that everyone's being safe. Um, so that was really good to hear that, you know, law enforcement's really involved in schools and everything nowadays too, along with what everything we do here at school to keep the kids safe, um, they're involved too. Um, some of the things we do when keeping kids safe here are our social teaching language we use. Um, we have things that we say like expected behavior, time and place, group plan uh, was funny once. These are all um, for socialthinking.com if you wanna write that website down or if you're online. Um, Michelle Garcia Winner is a person that set up that website and all these books and all these wonderful things. And it's where we got all of our language years ago and the kids have really taken to it and the teachers have really bought it and it's really helped out. Um, more social language to use at home. A lot of what we use at school here is if then statements. Um, and this would be good for um, time limits on things. So for example, what you could say at home is if you follow the group plan with the family dinner, then you can have 20 minutes on the game time on Minecraft. Um, so what we'd say at school is, you know, if you follow the group plan now and do your math homework maybe, or math work maybe at the end of class, you could have five minutes of free time. Uh, another thing we talk about with computers uh, is the grandma rule or Jesus rule. And this is one of my favorite ones I kind of I don't know if I came up with this or not or where I got it from, but the grandma rule or you find out a kid, something that the kid in their family, they really respect or a teacher they really respect. And you could put the picture of them on the computer to remind them when they're on the computer that grandma is watching or would you search this if grandma was sitting next to you? Okay, kind of thing. Just a reminder that um, everything you type in the computer, you know, is monitored somewhere in the world. So you want them to make safe choices. Another tip I give all the parents is to be friends with your students online if you allow them to have social media as they get older, okay? A workaround if they don't want to be your friend. I've had parents do this in the past. They would make an account for the family dog, um, and then they would friend request their son or, son or daughter, and if they, of course, accept that account, and then they can monitor where they're at, okay? Um, that's up to your whole parenting tactic, but it's a good way if you just want to make sure that what they're doing is safe. Um, on your chairs here, you have a book. We're not gonna read this book tonight, okay? But if you take this booklet home uh, and read it, you have a Google form quiz. Um, these are also at the front desk. They look like this. Ooh. You have a QR code there, or you can click that link in the presentation here, or we can get you the link. 
And there's 10 questions on there. You can take a quiz. Uh, and then if you do that, your son or daughter will get a dress down day. And you'll also learn about some safeguards on the internet. All right. uh, one of my favorite things um, I've done in the past with the kids to um, teaching them to become critical thinkers. Uh, Nicole and Matthew have also did this in my class. I don't know if they remember this or not. Okay, but it's my favorite website. We'll pull it up here uh, for teaching about critical thinking. All right, this is all about saving the Pacific Northwest tree octopus. Okay, and we would do this in seventh grade and we go through this whole website. Uh, the website's really in depth here. And we talk about, you know, what to look for on websites. Um, you can go to the sightings of the tree octopus. Okay, and as you go through here, you'll start to see that, you know, hey, maybe this isn't real. Okay. Uh, and then there's, you can buy um, merchandise, you can donate, okay? And then a teacher set this up years ago, and the whole point of this site is to let kids know that everything online isn't real, even though it could look real. And we'd always take a vote, and it's always about 50-50 in class, who thinks this is real, and who wants to donate, and who wants to save it after we read about how it's endangered. All right. All right, we're gonna next talk about assistive technology in the classroom. Um, I have kept some, got some quick videos here. Um, this first one for spell check, a lot of times even as adults, uh, we'll text something and if we're so far off base with how to spell it, like spell check won't even help us. Uh, so if that's happening, this is one of my favorite ones. so if we can say it, we can get the spell. Sometimes, even if you take a spell it doesn't help if we're too far off base. We might see this in our own lives with text messaging, right? Um, so Google can definitely help us learn how to spell things. Okay, and what we would do if we were in class, you could have the kid's computer there next to them, writing with pencil and paper, or if you're at home and you have your son or daughter writing, okay? Um, one thing I'd always recommend to parents, um, have them journal at home. They can write letters to God, a friend, you can pen pal with grandma, cousin, other family members. Even if there's no homework, get it out, um, a, a journal, and just have them write. Just physically writing, building up the hand, the hand stam stamina of writing um, can definitely help. And then this is a great way to help them learn how to spell too. All right, another good one we use is speech to text. This is an example of speech to text on Google Docs. You click on tools for a second. Now, I always have to teach the sentence for they could. So, for example, I say, what's your first sentence going to be? And I would say, the cat is something we want to hear it. And they put that, the cat is something we want to hear it. And I put it one more time in the sentence. That's a popular one. Um, now that's speech to text. Here's text to speech. This is an example of text to speech with read and write Chrome extension. Okay. Extensions are on Google Chrome. You can download there's thousands of like apps. Okay. We have this on all of kids' computers read and write. Um, I like everything in Google only because it's easy for the kids. Um, so basically what the kid would do, or she would click on this, it pops up here. There's a paid version, this is the free version again. I highlight things and then just click. Okay. This is easy and clear voice. There's a lot of ways to do this. Um, it's kind of like a favorite one. Um, you can also do this one with every Chromebook. 
And the setting is incredible. Accessibility is what we find in this select to see the work of population uh, here at students. Okay, so that one is called Read It and Write It from Chrome. It's a little purple puzzle piece. Okay. Even when I first started teaching, none of this stuff was like available or it was just coming on the scene. So this stuff has been moving quickly and changing, and they're making it super duper easy nowadays, which is wonderful for our kids. Um, this is probably one of the newest ones that just came out. We used to have to walk to the library and scan documents, but now it's a newer um, updates for Chromebooks and Chrome. Um, now you can add documents right to your computer. So let's say you can and I will shoot the password. Scan them, take them photo of it, and save them as PDF. If it's saved and not on drive, it'll show you here what we can do next. Okay. Let's keep going here. Um, once it's scanned, okay. Now, obviously, a lot of cell phones can do it, but you know, if you're in third, fourth, fifth grade, you don't have a cell phone yet, okay, this would be a way, or especially if you're in school and you don't have it, you're allowed to have a phone. It's a great way for education. Then, Cami is the next extension slash app. Example of a Google Chrome extension called Cami. Okay, so this is a PDF reader and um, editor. You can put it on this document. Um, you can type on this document. You can have it into your cell phone example. So let's say you know, they're in high school and the teacher has a lot of worksheet or a study guide and you want to allow it. Offered to them at that time, students would scan it, get it into Cam, and have the audio support for them. Right, so that's K A M I, Cam is another popular one. Uh, and then this one's for books, uh, Learning Ally. Um, and this one also can go into once they leave K to eight. There's a quick YouTube video on this one. Um, I'm Laura Yost, and I'm a middle school teacher for struggling readers. I'm a reading specialist, and I'm honored to have this. My students are all struggling readers, but they have great potential. What Learning Ally has done for them has been remarkable. That's why I was so excited about Learning Ally. It is a high-quality library of human narrated books that my kids want to read and also need to read. Now, instead of worrying about the mechanics of reading, my students are able to build on the understanding and the comprehension of their books and develop those higher level critical thinking skills and also really just enjoy reading. It has been miraculous. The change I've seen in my kids is huge. They're passing tests that they weren't passing before. Performing better on standardized tests is definitely an improvement I've seen. I believe in learning ally because I have seen what it has done with the students. The social side, the emotional side of who they are has really changed. And the result is just a happier student who is doing better in school and doing better in life. Okay. It's a real popular one. I'll show you exactly what that looks like. This video is really quick too on the kids' Chromebook. I have to say, learning now an example of what the kids would see. Um, so they have a book on their bookshelf. If we'd add it as a teacher, we'd add it as a teacher. I'll see you there as a teacher. Well, I'm going to go and a lot of textbooks can be on here too, which you also get for elementary school, college, etc. Uh, people volunteer to read these books and they upload them here. So sometimes you'll see the textbooks that the kids are using on this learning analysis. Uh, yeah, there's free versions of stuff. Um, 
sometimes pay for them. And if you come to JB when you leave in eighth grade, I know you get to keep this for how many years? Until you're done with education. So, okay. Right, but if you're not, but if you're not a JV, yeah, you have okay. to have a language. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a simple cool. little application. Uh, we love it for chapter books, and it really builds kids' confidence when they, you know, they can read a twenty chapter book um, with that. I don't think you want to mention uh, is the accessibility of um, Chromebooks, cell phones, uh, at home stuff, there's all kinds of good stuff in there. You know, a popular one is dictation. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this, like I said, but I want to touch base on this one. Uh, I'll start to do dictation. I'm pretty popular. So basically, all you need to do is And then you can do another voice to text option. Yeah, it's a little more better than ours, and I have that one, my favorite one, but it could be an option um, for certain things. The point is, take a look around for all aspects of accessibility. There's always new stuff coming out, and ways that kids can help themselves out and support themselves as they grow up. All right, so the point of that video was on any computer or cell phone, check in the accessibility. Uh, when Mrs. O'Neill came in today, we, she actually, we were looking for things for audio, and she, we went right into the accessibility, and we were able to find a couple of things that she's been using. Um, just want to make you aware that there's this stuff is out there. Sometimes you got to search for it. Um, and then, the next, go back to that. I just want so when you have all of these um, accommodations, right? Every child is going to kind of uh, pivot their learning to one of them audio, book, speech, text. Everybody's different. So, what I want you to do with your little ones is I want you to ask them, what do they like? Do they like the human reader or not? Do they like the male voice versus the female voice? Do they like the speech? If you're going to know that you need to learn the ally, that there's speech, write that down. If you go in an IEP meeting and the teacher today will say something like, well, what is speed one? What is speed needs to be coming to these meetings? Well, speed can be in the meeting, but it doesn't have to be physically in the meeting, right? So you could say, well, he learned, he listens to learn the ally, he likes the female voice. He also likes speech 42. He would prefer to be speech to text um, on a Chromebook, but he likes to have the paper next to him to the left of the computer, not to the right of the computer. However that looks, that has to be defined in the profile <laughs> under like specific technology and how it looks. But the thing that happens is the first thing will look a lot different than the second grade, and second grade can look a lot different than high school. So all of these amazing tools we have. I want you to ask your learner what they like, what they don't like, yeah. and adjust that and bring that information to the next meeting. And that can be written in your IEP. Um, that's all I have for the assistive technology stuff. Uh, but like I said, this stuff's always changing. That's In the 12 years I've been teaching, this stuff has moved super quick. And it's wonderful because they're making every day it's getting easier and we're helping more kids. So. As it changes, just be ready for it. And uh, if you need help, I'm available by email, phone. I'm here. I help adults put their cell phones to even drive and go to school here. <laughs> um, so I don't. I that's my job is to help people. So reach out to me with any kind of question, and I will more than gladly give you some time and help you with whatever you need. Thank you. Thank you. So when you have a planning meeting, you have the planning meeting, the bottom of the planning meeting, it'll say, does do we need to do an assistive technology assessment? And typically the school will say, um, yes, sir, right? And they'll say, well, someone on site can do this assistive technology assessment. And that's fine. But you need to remember you want something different. You want to know about speech to text. You want to know about reading with your ears versus reading with your eyes. You don't want to know about an assistive technology tool that helps them navigate school 
it's navigating the learning piece, it's navigating the books, it's navigating the writing. So that's different. You need to make sure you identify that. When you have your ETR, right? Your ETR is where you dump all the assessments. There's where you can identify that you did the assessment in the planning meeting and their findings in the assistive technology will be now written in the ETR. So then you take it to another level, and this is what we were talking about, is the IEP. In, I like to put it in the profile because I feel like the profile is saying Stephen likes, Stephen utilizes assistive technology. He does speech to text. He does audio books. He uses Learning Ally. He likes P42. He likes a female voice. All of that, those findings, goes in the profile. Um, I think it's section two in the IEP. It actually asks, does the child need assistive technology? That's a game day decision with your district. Some districts don't like putting assistive technology there because they say it's universal design. I disagree. I disagree. Everybody in this space needs assistive technology. It should be checked, assistive technology. Because when you are going off to college, when you're going off and doing these amazing things you're doing, if you don't have a paper trail that this child needed assistive technology, you're not going to get it. So universal design is a beautiful thing, but for this population, I want it checked, and I want it identified in that ETR and written in that IEP. Did I answer your question? Also, on top of that, just keep in mind, too, that if your child currently has an IEP, when they go to college, it's automatically turned into a 504 plan. So they do not have an IEP when they're in college. So those accommodations, each college is going to have a different list of accommodations that they will be able to provide for your child. So if you have that, as if they're on a 504 plan, it's part of their 504 plan. If it's on their IEP, it's part of their IEP. That is the only way to get those accommodations in college um, is if you have that paper trail that this was something that they needed for you know, grade school, junior high, and high school as well. So that's why it's important to make sure that it's on those documents. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the risks of technology, and I'm kind of stealing this slide from Jay Burke, um, but I did kind of look up some things. I also have a 20-year-old and an 18-year-old that spend a lot of time on technology and on games. Um, so I am kind of in the same situation when they were little, wanting to be on their Xbox, wanting to get a phone before I felt that they were ready for a phone. So technology addiction is something that's real. Um, it is something that you face as a parent. You can tell that your child might be addicted to technology if it's hard for them to be away from their phone or from the computer or from their video games. Um, if the amount of time that they are on it seems to be more excessive, if it's taking um, away from your time as a family. So you always kind of see maybe the kids are at the kitchen table, but they're on their phone or they want to have their phone with them or they're rushing through dinner because they wanna rush right back down to get to their video games. If they are um, avoiding homework or refusing to do homework, um, if they're obsessively talking about a game that they want to play or games that they're playing with their friends, these are all things that are gonna show you that they are kind of getting beyond what is typical or what should be typical for technology. Using that technology does impact their brain. So when they are using technology, it is diminishing the amount of gray and white matter in the brain. So it's preventing some of the connections that they are having or the way that their brain is going to um, access information in the future. So it disrupts the brain's ability to differentiate day from night. So even if they have their phone and they are using it as the alarm clock, that UV light or whatever it is that's part of that blue light, it does impact their sleep. So personal story, my son is 20. Um, we had to bring him to a neurologist because his sleep schedule is completely messed up, partially from COVID, but partially as a college student being on his video games 24 seven, his body does not know what is daytime and what is nighttime. So he has to turn off all electronics 45 minutes before he goes to bed and then he has to slowly get into bed. So it does as little as like the light that's on your TV, that little red light or the the light that comes from the TV, that will change that circadian rhythm and it will prevent you from recognizing your body being able to recognize day and night. It also makes the brain uh, more susceptible mem to memory problems. So a lot of times with technology, it is used to that instant gratification. So you are having almost a um, random reinforcement with some of the video games. 
Sometimes the level is really easy to get through on one of their games, so they continue to play, but then the next level might be more difficult, so they want to keep playing until they get past that level. It releases that dopamine, which is that feel-good kind of neurotransmitter. So the more that they feel that, the more they play to try to get that same experience or that same feeling. So you wanna make sure that you're trying to do things to kind of prevent that connection or, or prevent that time that they're having on the computer. Um, with the video games, it also gives that false sense of relational security. So they feel like they have friends because there's friends that they're talking to on the video games. So many times when my kids were in high school, they might have four or five friends and I would hear them talking. I would come home from work, going down the stairs, assuming that I was going to see four or five kids on the computer, but they're talking to each other or downstairs playing on the video games, but they're downstairs. My son was the only one down there. He was talking with friends through the computer and having conversations that way, but they weren't always friends that were in the same city or in the same school. And you don't know who those friends are always. Like they might say that they're a certain age. They might say that they're a certain um, gender. You have no idea. They are just assuming by the screen name who that person's going to be. Having that false sense of relational security and emotional, um, that relational security, the kids can say things. This happens at school um, that comes into the school. Kids can say things that are really mean when they're playing the game because they're in the middle of playing and they're not thinking about what they're saying. And they're hurting other kids, their friends' feelings if they're playing because they're saying something about how that person's playing the game or if they're not playing as well. It does tend to then come into school the next day and there's arguments about things that happened on the video games at home and it causes those relationship problems. It's also difficult because sometimes they might be texting if they have a phone, maybe they're texting with their friends or there's a group chat or Roblox and some of the other games that they play have a text capability. Ability within it, it is hard to understand what a person might be trying to say. So not being able to see that person's face, not being able to understand the impact of their words, those things can affect how well they're behaving or how well that they're working in school. Also that heightened attention deficit symptoms because of that instant gratification. You know, there are, I think it's one out of, I don't know, 300 or so that are diagnosed with attention deficit. Some of those issues are really just because they are playing those video games and it's that instant gratification. Or they're on YouTube videos and the YouTube video lasts like 30 seconds or TikTok where it's short videos. Everything happens so quick and so fast. And even with the video games, a lot of the research is looking into ways to get the child kind of engaged more quickly because you don't know when that kind of positive reinforcement is going to happen. So they're used to that instant gratification. They're used to things happening quickly. So when it takes time to have that mental endurance, when it's coming to a long-term project in school, they don't have that mental endurance anymore. They want things to happen very quickly. It also can cause isolation, extreme anxiety, and depression. So whether it's Facebook or Instagram, sometimes even as adults, you are looking at the persona that someone wants you to see. So you see the perfect life. You see the person that has the perfect family, they're going on all these perfect trips, and that is not what it really looks like in real life. And so you're comparing yourself to others, which causes you to feel isolated, might cause you to have some anxiety or could cause depression. There's also that fear of missing out. So everyone says, oh, we have that FOMO, you're, you're scared of what you're gonna miss. So sometimes with the students, if they're trying to look at the computer, they wanna know what's happening because they don't want someone to post something and they're not being able to see it. So anytime someone likes their picture, anyone time someone shares their picture, they feel like they're personally having those likes and they're personally having those friends. But again, it can cause some um, ill side effects. Now, the question is, how do you have those conversations with your children? So you might have your child who wants to be on their phone all the time or who wants to be on the video games all the time. I would say I understand as parents, you know, my kids were home by themselves, like probably by sixth or seventh grade. So I did give them their phone when they turned 12 because I wanted to be able to get in touch with them. We don't have a landline. So sometimes kids do need to have phones. So you can sit down with them and you can tell them, you are gonna have this phone 
but it is only going to have phone capabilities. Or you can go to parental controls on the phones and you can limit the time that they're able to be on apps for certain things. So entertainment apps, game apps, and you can limit the time. You can also just say they can't have any apps on the phone until it's your phone that you're using and you have the app that they're gonna be using so that you can limit the time that they're playing. So you wanna be able to say to them, you know, we need to have a conversation about these, this technology and how much time you're spending on this technology. Children's brains, people's brains are not fully developed until age 25. It's that prefrontal cortex. So it's the decision-making part of the brain. It's the impulse control part of the brain. And so because it's not developing until 25 or so, we need as parents to be able to have those conversations with our child and say, you need to learn how to limit. You need to learn how to use this responsibly. Um, sit down, explain what needs to happen, explain the changes that are going to occur, explain what will happen if there are issues of pushback. So what I had to do with my son, because he was on his phone from the minute he got home until I got home from work, which sometimes was three or four hours, you know, I had told him the phone is being turned off because I had parental controls. It wasn't able to be used during certain times. When I get home, if your homework is completed, then you will have a certain amount of time of the computer. When it was time for bed, we shut things off 30 to 40 minutes. So I said, you know, we are turning everything off before we you know, go to bed. We're going to have a bedtime routine. You're using a regular alarm clock for your phone so that your phone can be in somewhere else, like in the kitchen, so that it can be charged. You can use a regular alarm clock. So if there was pushback, you know, every time he whined and complained that this wasn't fair, you know, he hated the fact that he was in this household and we didn't let him do what he wanted to do. I just kept a timer and however long he complained about it, that was the amount of time that was taken away from technology the next day. So it isn't always easy. It is sometimes a nightmare. You do feel like the bad person, but like you do need to teach them what they need to do to be successful and to kind of work on things. So set daily limits of how much time they can be on the computer, you know, or be on their phone. Um, wait until they're a certain age until they get their phone. Set those parental controls. Use nighttime settings. So once it's a certain time, all technology is off. As adults, it is the same for us. If you are using technology, it really should be turned off 30 to 40 minutes before you go to bed because otherwise it does impact your ability to sleep. Use a regular alarm clock. Don't use your phone as your alarm clock and have that consistent bedtime routine. So think about the technology and when students should have access to it, what they should have access to. There are phones that you can get that are just phones. They don't have to have apps. When should you add those apps to that phone or when you should you allow them to use it? The other thing, and this is one of the things that Jay talked about was change your Wi-Fi password daily. You are able to change it and then have maybe three things that your child needs to do in order to get the Wi-Fi password for that day. So if they come home, they have to get their homework done. They have to clean off the table and then they have to be, um, you know, 20 minutes of reading. If they do that, then they will get the Wi-Fi password for that day. So you are able to do things like that. What time is the bedtime routine going to start? One of the things to keep in mind is kids that are between like the ages of seven and like 15 need about 10 hours of sleep a night, which I know sometimes when they have to get up in the early in the morning means that they may be going to bed at seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night. That might not be possible, but at least have that routine where they're turning things off. They're slowly kind of getting the day. They're taking a shower. They're brushing their teeth. Things are going to kind of get them ready for that sleep. It prompts their body to know that it's going to be time to sleep. Um, and then provide some of the healthy highs. So what can you do as a parent to take back some of that control in your home? Go on hikes. Do things that are going to release some of those regular endorphins in a healthy way sports, cross country, a lot of our kids do well in sports that are not necessarily team related. So cross country, wrestling, swimming, things that they can do independently, have them do some of those. Go on a hike at, after dinner or something to get them used to kind of getting that same feeling from electronics, but doing something more appropriately. Model the activities, like how do you deal with stress? How do you deal with situations that come up um, at work, talk through. So we always say when we're reading with our students, sometimes our students that might have some reading difficulties, we kind of talk through exactly what we're doing. So we might say to them, oh, you know, I was reading this and it says that so-and-so is going to go back to the house. Well, we know that, you know, Michael Bay was in the house. And so this is probably what's going to happen. 
they're not able to kind of think of those things on their own. So we model and use the language that we would be using. So you can say, you know, I had a really stressful day. I really want to get on the computer, but I know it's not good because if I get onto the computer, I'm going to go down that rabbit hole of watching Instagram or YouTube videos for four hours. So I think what I'm going to do is maybe read for 10 minutes, or I think I'm going to go for a walk. Why don't you come with me? And kind of talk through what you do when you're stressed at the end of the day, instead of just getting on a computer and allowing technology to kind of help things with you. Nurture some of the social development. So try to get together with friends outside of school, set up some of those expectations, maybe have them play board games. I know that the Westlake campus has a board game club. So maybe come up with activities that they can do outside of school that are not technology related, but that is including other people that they can kind of connect with and become friends with. Um, looking to find some of those things that are not technology based or technology limited. So we want it as much as we can know. Technology is gonna be helpful for them. It's a tool that's gonna to help them throughout grade school, throughout junior high, throughout high school, throughout college, um, and into their future. But we need to make sure that they are able to kind of develop some of those skills and they're, as they're younger before it becomes more of an addiction. If you feel that your child is truly addicted to technology, then I would reach out to Dr. Burke. He does have um, activities, he does have some workshops, he has some programs that work with students who are addicted to technology to help them kind of learn and replace some of those behaviors that they use. Any questions? Does he have like yeah, so I think if you go to his website or you call, there is a addiction kind of program that he uses. I, I'm not sure how long it is, but I do know that he has a specific addiction program for technology. I think it's a boot camp. I think there's a boot camp version. And then I also think there's like, he does a, something in the wilderness to get away from technology. Um, one of the things that he always finds to be uh, pretty amazing is that they do a kind of cold turkey, take technology away from the kids, and they survey them before and after. And the amount of um, response that they get that the kids feel lighter after it. Now they do go through kind of withdrawal. I mean, that, that's a very real thing. And he watches it and they are out in the wilderness and have to deal with it. Um, but then once they come back to it, they can then put better parameters on it because they say things like, I felt lighter or I didn't have so much worry. I slept better than I ever have. Um, so those are all kind of some of the things that um, he has really become an expert in, in the area of addictiveness of technology for our kids and coming out of the pandemic, people are addicted to technology, not just our kids. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's something that we also wanted to address. I mean, we have to be examples of this. So we may think, you know, you can't have your phone right now, but if I'm sitting there at dinner and I'm texting, I am being a very poor example to my child of what healthy habits look like. So now that my daughter is five, she calls us to the carpet when we say, you know, there's no technology at dinner. Well, so now my husband and I, we put our phones on top of the microwave face down. We turn notifications off and we tried to be present to one another. Well, then I got my watch. And so my watch now will light up and I see I have a text and I go under the table and I'm texting back and my daughter will go, mama. And so, you know, you, you have to be aware of your own responsibility throughout this. Um, and you have to face some of this, um, of how you use technology. And even though I can say, well, it's, it's for work. You know, I'm not a doctor saving lives. The work can wait. I don't need to respond right away. Are there other questions or any that have come in online? So that was a question for Josh, and he's coming on up. It was about all the assistive technology that we have today. Yeah, all that stuff is pushed out to the kids' Chromebooks. Um, we, if it's not free, we do pay for it at JB for them. Um, but like I think Mary 
Ms. O'Neill said, uh, we want to make sure, you know, that it's something that they that they do need. So if it is something you feel they need uh, and you want to learn more about it, um, reach out to us and we will definitely, we can go down there um, and I can do a little training with you and them um, and how to get it on a home computer. I know at Lyndhurst, our junior high students are allowed to take their computers home and, you know, we're slowly working there at the other two campuses. Um, so I think what, and the goal is we're exposing them to all this, seeing what works. Um, and like Ms. O'Neill said, you know, you want to put that on their IP, on what works for them, what they like. And then as they go into high school and college, they take ownership of, ownership of it, self-advocacy, what to email their teacher, hey, so-and-so in high school, Mr. So-and-so, I need this um, to help me learn better. Uh, I think Matthew is a good example of that, all the stuff. He was our resident tech guy at JB years ago, and he trialed and aired all this stuff, and he went through it all. And then I think, as you know, as he went on to high school, he really took ownership of it and used it and was a self advocate for himself and reached his full potential because of it. So, for most of the things that um, Josh talked about, they are free. They're extensions that are on Google, so you don't have to pay for them. There's not login credentials. Um, for the Learning Ally, there is login credentials because it is a um, like a site license that we have. If your child needs Learning Ally, the um, teachers have created that account for them. They have their username and password, and we've made sure that they know how to independently download books. So they have those available to be able to read them. Um, they might just be listening to them at school, but that is something that they have that username and password for. Um, Cami, I believe, is a free extension, so you are able to have it on your um, own Chromebook. You don't have to use like a, a login in order to get that um, because it is an extension that you can download from Google. Um, so most of the things that we showed you are things that you can have at home without any kind of credential. The only one that really has that credential is Learning Ally. We have a site license because our students have learning disabilities and have a reading disability or a physical disability. And so we qualified for a site license. Otherwise, you have to have a paper from your doctor to say that you have a reading disability or a physical disability and need Learning Ally. And then you would have your own username and password for that. And if you're at a public school or another public school or wherever you may be, they don't have Learning Ally. So you just pass. If you're in a different academic environment, you just ask, do you have learning ally? If they don't, then what do you have so my child can read this textbook or get this information? Um, just keep asking those questions. More questions? Can any of the speakers talk about if neurodiverse kids are more susceptible to technology addiction? We find that for our autism, ADHD son, eight years old, really struggles with impulse control and stopping screen time regardless of what he put on the device. Um, yes, I would say that that does impact. Um, my oldest son, who is 20, has severe ADD, ADHD. Um, so everything, even when he's on medication, he has a hard time stopping preferred activities. Um, in order to initiate non-preferred activities. So it is kind of trying to stop that um, impulse of kind of just staying on the computer. So that's why if you set limits, if you set specific times, sometimes the routine and the structure can provide that support so that it's not constantly being on the computer or being on their video games. If I gave my son the chance, he would be on his video game from the minute he woke up until the minute he passed out from being so tired from playing video games. So really setting those kind of structure routine as this is the time that you're able to play it. it. I can tell you as a mom, it is not going to be easy to get them off the computer or off the video games because it is a very highly suggestive, highly rewarding um, kind of just impulse. And so you really have to kind of deal with the backlash that comes with a lot of tears or yelling. Um, but the more consistent you are when it comes to saying, no, you need to do this now, or you don't get technology until you do this, this, and this, the easier it's going to be. Um, one of the things that I did was, you know, video games are extremely expensive. And so we would take a picture of the video game that he wanted and I would cut it into puzzle pieces. And so we would have a routine that he had to do. And every time he was able to do the routine for that day, 
he got a puzzle piece, but it was probably 14 pieces that he had to put together in order to kind of extend that time because video games are expensive. Um, so you can kind of set up behavior, kind of routines or expectations, and then just create a chart um, and using kind of like technology as a reward or a positive reinforcer, um, but limiting the time that they're able to use it. Any other questions? Yeah. So the statement, the statement was that during the school week, the computer is not being allowed to be used, but then during the weekend, he's using it and wants to be on it all the time and then has trouble giving it up, even though he does chess or some other activities. And, and I would say I would really kind of, even with the weekend, I would start maybe setting up where there has to be like a non-preferred activity that is done first before he gets the time on the computer or on the iPad or on the game, um, and even setting a timer. So, you know, it could be if you do 30 minutes of reading, you can have 30 minutes of computer time. And then as difficult as it is, it's really taking it away if you have to lock it up somewhere, lock it up somewhere, um, but really kind of keeping to that strict expectation. And I will say there are sometimes, so like some of the games I know that my son plays, you know, maybe it's not saying that it's only a half hour. Maybe it's one game because I know that sometimes my son, the games that he plays, it might take like a good 45 minutes to an hour to play. And if he's playing with friends, you don't want him to like kind of have to say, oh, I have to go because my you know mom says I can't play anymore. Like, so maybe said, well, you can play one game, but when the game is over with, then you're done. The other thing to keep in mind is I would make sure that they're playing the game like where you're able to see it so it's not like it's in their bedroom it's not like it's in the basement you know it may ruin your time on tv if you have hulu you know use your computer or phone to watch your tv shows or something but i would make sure that when you're on when they're playing those games that it is in a place where you are able to hear or see what is happening So the question is, how much time do you think, yeah, how much time do you think is adequate? I, I think if it's the weekend and you're really making sure that during the week, they're really keeping up on schoolwork, you know, I think a couple hours, I, I think is fine. I, I would say if it's getting to be where it's like seven hours or five hours and like the majority of the time, it's preventing them from going to the chess club that he's doing at the library or preventing him from, you don't want it to prevent him from doing other things. You want them to recognize that there are other things that are going to give them that same feeling and that same you know, uh, release of, of energy. And so as long as it's not impacting what they're doing, it's not impacting their friendship, You know, three hours, two, three hours, I think is fine. I think the difficulty is when it becomes like five, six, seven hours. Um, and it may be for our students, especially those that are on the spectrum or those who have attention issues or those who have anxiety issues, sometimes maybe that might be too long and it's really just one game a day or you know an hour a day because if you give them a little bit, it's going to be that much more difficult to take it away if, if they had that time.
question is our thoughts on the Bark app or other small apps. Um, I don't know that. I never heard of that app. Um, I, I, I would try anything though. I mean, it, it's worth a shot. Uh, one thing I do want to say about parental controls, what Joey talked about earlier, is um, I do help out with family um, with an adult that has special needs. And with parental controls, it's once you get the hang of it, it's okay. You might be intimidating at first, and the kids can get around it, or people you work on can get around it. But if you stick with it, you can literally control anything on these devices. You can shut down certain apps. You can um, shut down certain websites. You can do a lot, and that usually can shape the behavior of, you know, back to our if then statements. If you do X, then you can get Y. Um, so it's a good motivator. Um, so the point of that is don't be afraid of parental controls. Uh, try them, and it's a learning curve with all this stuff. So I just quickly looked up the Bark app is a parental control app. Um, so I would say because technology changes, so like it was much easier before Snapchat came around because like I had all of my son's text messages coming to my phone automatically, or I was able to go onto his phone and he had to show me all of the things that he was texting throughout the day. Snapchat, because they disappear and I did make sure that he is friends with me on Snapchat. You know, you get to see some stories, but you don't get to see everything that happens in Snapchat and you can't go in there and look at it. So anytime there's things that are apps for parental control, I would look to see what's available and what it does, because as technology increases and does more things for the child, there's going to be parental controls that get added so that you can find more apps that are going to help you kind of support your child so they don't become like too attached to it. So I would have to look at the Bark app. It did say that it was parental controls, but a lot of it is kind of hit or miss where you have to kind of try it and see what happens, see what's available, what kind of parental controls you have. Um, and then if that works, it might work for a little bit and something new is going to come out and they're going to have to look for another app. So, um, you know, at least the one thing that I think happens is as technology changes, there are other things that come out to help parents support some of the things that we need to do to make sure that our students and children are safe. And the kids will get around the parental controls. The kids are super yeah. smart. When that happens, do not get discouraged. Get back in there, fight back, lock down what you got to do. Let them know that you're smart too. Okay. Um, it's all to keep them safe. I also think it's really important. We, we recently learned from different law enforcement that we've been working with um, that Snapchat we actually can figure out a way. They do have access to getting you know, pictures shared through Snapchat and they do have a way. And I think part of what's really critical with our kids are so smart, they do get around parental controls, but they also need to know that with this, there's a responsibility. And that if you're going to put some things out there that law enforcement, or if you do something stupid, it does follow you. <laughs> and, and we are trying to teach our kids often that yes, you have these struggles, but if, if you do something that follows you, there's, it doesn't matter what your diagnosis is at that point, it can prevent you from opportunities in your future. So yes, keep locking it down, but also engage in dialogue that's meaningful, that, you know, look, you do something stupid, they can recover those things. They can recover those pictures and they will, let me tell you, they will. Yes, yes. Are there any other questions? Golf. Well, I think um, we are really lucky here in town. We have a program called First Tee, um, which is a golf program. You can write that down. Um, and actually, Mr. Deckard in the back um, knows First Tee well, but it is a program that's designed to um, help me here if I'm going to get this wrong, but it's, it's really designed to build character development in children, build some of those social skills, build confidence to get them off of their devices and doing something productive. Um, it doesn't mean you have to be a great golfer. You can start it at any time. It's for boys and girls. I just went to their event and it was fantastic. 
Um, but it is uh, a wonderful opportunity. And my understanding is they have things throughout the year that the kids can participate in. So if there is an interest and maybe not an awesome ability, I would look into first seat. Yeah. And again, he's the resident expert back there uh, for chair uh, for Steve. Any other questions? And again, we, we understand that with Jody did a fantastic job um, still creating all the content that you know Dr. Burke would have gone over, but we do understand he has massive resources in this area. So please visit his website, um, reach out to him reach out to us and we can connect you. If you have specific questions, we'd be happy to relay them um, and get you an answer in a timely fashion. Um, we also have um, another, this is gonna continue the speaker series. Uh, we do cater this to what you guys give us feedback upon. So if there is something we can pivot, we can add, we can do another conversation around this. We can. This is part of when you get the survey, um, I believe tomorrow you'll get a survey. Um, please answer it and give us honest feedback. We are trying to do this to bring our community together and support one another on this very difficult journey. So in person or tune in live um, in February, we'll be back at the Lynnhurst campus. And this is helping your special needs child navigate teen temptations and topics. We are gonna talk about a little bit about sex. We are gonna talk about a little bit of the things that they are gonna deal with when they get to high school and some of the um, you know, difficulties in kind of at some points being naive and then um, kind of being thrown into a new environment. We are gonna address some of that and Dr. Burke's gonna talk a lot about uh, some of those uh, temptations. And then April 10th, we're in JV Akron and it's navigating the transition from elementary school to high school. JB has some amazing teachers and um, administrators that are gonna talk about what we have done from setting the IEP up and the transition plan, making sure that our kids are self-advocates when they go to high school. We may even bring in some of our high school alumni to talk about what their experience was. Um, so that's gonna be a critical one as you have older kiddos um, leaving JB after their eighth grade year. And then June 7th, JB Lindhurst, leveraging your child's strengths for a transition into the workforce. Um, we're trying to always engage and talk with employers. Um, we're trying to always talk about what the resources are because we recognize that not every child, not every person is meant to go to a four-year college. Um, and if they are, we still need to have employers who understand um, the, the great benefits that our children, our students, our people will add to the workforce someday. So we're going to have that conversation on June 7th. And that's really all we have. You will get a survey. You will get these slides. Please reach out to Josh. He is such a gem to JB, and he is willing to help you navigate this to really optimize what your children need in our setting, in another setting, or in your home setting. Um, so please reach out uh, as needed. Yes, it'll be sent to you in an email with, with the email that you registered in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good night.